Hello everyone, just logging in now. Apologies for the delay. Oh, we've got 124 people online, 126. We'll give it a couple of minutes, or well, a minute or two, because I'm conscious we're a little bit late. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to week two of the Art of Debating. Um, we have with us Cahill Beale, CEO of the Irish National Stud, uh, Joseph O'Brien, the King of the Hill, uh, and great horse trainer. And we have, unfortunately, my father, not yet. We're hopeful that uh, he will uh, come online shortly. My uh, sister Rose is desperately trying to aid her, uh, aid him as we speak. Uh, but I'm delighted you can all join us. There's 162 live participants at the moment. Um, the plan is a little less rarefied than last week. Last week we had the fun of uh, meeting a navel, Midnight Be Sue, and uh, Deirdre. This week we're down to reality. We're down to what so many of us aspire to do, and that's the commercial breeding and how commercial breeding works, how people can produce a racehorse at a commercial level that can show talent on the uh, race course and also perhaps a profit in the sales ring. Um, as before, we have a Q&A function, so you will see at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, there's a Q&A button. I'd encourage you to hit that button, send us questions, and our panelists would be delighted to help. We also have a polling feature, so we will have a polling at the end of every mayor. We will decide amongst ourselves what we will breed our, our beloved mayors to, which is going to be pretty exciting. Um, but again, it's not really about what we breed it to at the end of the day. It's about the process. It's about learning and hearing from our two great experts, and hopefully, in a few moments, three great experts. The best bred man in this whole webinar, my father. Um, so, uh, our, uh, our uh, brief today, I just to quickly go over that again, was our client is Mary Make a Few Quid. She is a lady who's raised a few quid. She's gone to her family, she's gone to her friends, and she said, look, I want to be involved in this industry. I want to breed races and horses at the commercial level. And I suppose, Kyle, I'll turn to you. If someone came to you with this brief to you, what would be your initial advice to them? Um, I, think, I, I think you'd start off with doing something very similar to what you've done in a sense that you would actually try and book a, or, or purchase a portfolio of mares, three or four, if you could afford them, as opposed to putting all your eggs in one basket i think there's a lot of um a lot of sense to that i think the two fundamentals that i would always look at i suppose keeping it very simple are the race record i think you know uh if if, if a mare can run she can generally produce something within her you know you know within the 20 or 30 pounds radius of what she could achieve herself so i like i like a filly that can run and a filly that's produced a good horse or a black type horse already a mare that's produced a black type horse again statistically is far more likely to produce a second one than a mare that's unproven or that that hasn't yet uh, had a stakes winner so those are the two very simple things you'd look at at the very beginning and then obviously the limit of what you can afford then is 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 your budget so that that's what limits you i suppose in in every sense but yeah starting off race record and the ability of the first dam, and then you look a little bit deeper. Then, as you as you whittle them down through a catalogue into into deeper pedigrees and that sort of thing. Uh, and I suppose Joseph, we can kind of get lost as a commercial breeder. We're we're thinking about breeding it for the commercial market, and that's people like you that go to the yearling sales and say, "I want to buy a certain number of yearlings to fill my stables, have my two year olds for the next year." And I know frequently people will talk about the physical and the physical being the most important, but of course you need to walk that stable door and look at the horse. And when you're flicking through your catalogue, it comes through the door. What are the initial things you look at a catalogue page and say, that's something that excites me. That's, that's something at a commercial level that you think is uh, appealing to you. Yes, I suppose everyone, different people have different ways of, of going about it, Jack. 
Um, personally, I, I like to see um, uh, a what the animal is by, what the mare is by, and then and then if the mare has produced anything of note so far. So they're probably the three things that if we like the stallion or the broodmare stallion, or if the mare has produced a stakes horse, we would definitely see those animals. And then, and then we would also try to see really as broad a section as, as we possibly could and as many as we can. But they're probably the three things that, that would, would first draw you to, to, uh, to make sure that you see a horse, what it's by, uh, what the mare is by, and, and what she has produced already. So we have three mares today. Um, they are three bears. In fact, our own farm, Tinnacle House, bought last year, and we just we did that because at least we can say these are three bears that we made the decision. We thought they were value at the time, and then we can perhaps explore what you all think we we, sh we should have bred uh, these horses to this year. So hopefully, that's an interesting exercise for everyone. And our first mare is Tarasilia. So here she is. She's a big, strapping Shamardal mare, and uh, Cahal what's the most striking thing about this mare for you? Um, yeah, the, as Joe said, the, the broodmare sire is always something you would, you know, you, you would take note of uh, very quickly. Um, I think she's got a fairly well-balanced pedigree going back through the, through the generations. But I always start off with the question, are they proven or are they unproven? And bearing in mind what we're doing here, like we, we've got a limit, we've only got 60 grand that we're allowed to spend. Um, the first question here is, is she proven or is she not proven? And obviously she's, she's having her first fold. So she's an unproven mare. So your starting point is probably she needs a proven stallion before we can assess whether she's a good mare or not. So she's of the three mares, she's probably a medium term bet here as opposed to the other two, which, you know, which are slightly older and have already proven themselves as stakes producers. Whereas this mare is obviously coming straight off the track. Uh, she ran three times, you know, obviously she's an average racehorse, but uh, she's got a very nice pedigree in relation to the sisters and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so go back to what you're saying, Carl. What, what do you mean by proven? What, what, what is that? Sorry. So I suppose uh, to, to us, like we obviously we all would like to buy an Able or, or a filly that's one group ones, but the budget dictates that we can only buy a filly that can run, you know, to a rating of 80 or 90 or 100, or obviously in this case, a little bit below. So we've all got to uh, move the dial in relation to what we can live with or what we can't live with. And in, in the case of her, obviously, she's been bought because she's out of a, of, a, of a group three winner and she's a sister to a listed winner who was, who was obviously placed in group threes as well. So it's, she's probably one that hasn't been bought specifically for her racing ability, but more for her, her back pedigree. Um, so when I say unproven, I mean, she, she has yet to show she's unproven as a racehorse. And she's yet to prove whether um, she can produce a stakes horse, obviously, because she hasn't had the opportunity yet. And Joseph, you've, of course, had great success with uh, Shabardal uh, Broodmare Star as La Trobe. Your Irish Derby winner was out of a Shabardal mare. I suppose what's interesting about this mare is, you know, she's rated 49. She wasn't very fast. She wasn't very good herself. What's attractive about her is she's a nice immediate pedigree and she's by Shabardal. But does a race record sometimes put you off? Would you kind of think... That's not one for me. If the mother wasn't fast, she, the, the, the resulting foals are unlikely to be fast. Yeah, no, no, for me personally, no, I, I obviously would prefer if the mare was good. But personally, I, I, I would be very happy to, to buy an animal if the physical was good enough. She's a Shamardal mare. It's a nice pedigree. And uh, she seems, from you know the few pictures that we've seen, she doesn't seem to be a very bad physical or anything. So I would say that... that um, um, uh, I, the, like, the, I wouldn't put me off at all. And obviously... Shamradal has proven to be a fantastic broodmare sire, and he's going to he's going to probably um, uh, do a hell of a lot more in the in the years to come as a broodmare sire. So uh, we've had some great suggestions, and I know that two panelists, uh, have, our two experts, have looked through the uh, homework. I saw Connor Norris, and uh, many more were promoting Australia. Isabella Paul was talking about Harry Angel. Uh, ben Merle was talking about Ho Holy Roman Emperor. There's so many options. I think that's what's great about the commercial market that you just have a multitude of options. Um, Cahill, if someone was walking in the door of the Irish National Stud and they were thinking, you know, how do I get the best of my relationship with the Irish National Stud? What's your starting point for breeders and how do you kind of uh, build that relationship over the years? Uh, I think have, picking up the phone and, or, 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 you know, in, no in normal circumstances when we're not all locked down, having a cup of tea and having a chat about your pedigrees uh, 
you know, at a, at a time of the season, maybe when there's not too much pressure on, that's always the best way to do it. So we're very happy to take your entire book of mares or your entire, you know, catalogue of sure, mares. I'm sure it would be. I'm sure it would be. And, <laughs> and, and attempt to mate them appropriately to Irish national stud stallions. You know, we're, uh, we're happy to do that. So, it, but all joking aside, we, we would get a lot of people who would send us ma matings and we, we try not to be too disingenuous about the thing and actually try to mate them properly. If, if they don't suit the roster of stallions we have, we wouldn't be afraid to mate them to outside uh, operations as well. You know, so we are here to provide that kind of a service and that's a good starting point then and I suppose especially for breeders with three four and five mares you know we'd obviously be always trying to to produce a package uh for them that you know they can they can essentially make a profit on all their stock and give themselves the best chance of producing a runner it's a dual purpose that we have is you try to make your breeder profitable they have to stay in business but also at the end of the day the lollipop at the end of the straight is the most important thing and that's where the real uh, commerciality comes into it if you're willing to take a medium-term look at these kind of things. So just, just for a question uh, online for you, and that, that is, you know, in your career, are there stallions that you think have been unfairly underestimated and you think offer a bit of value for a mare like this in this bracket? Yeah, well, I would say that in general, the market favours the quicker type stallion. So your, your six, seven furlong type horses, sprinter milers. Um, and, and as a result, you'll find that there's value in the middle distance type horse. Um, so, so for, for like a Tarasilla, so probably this, your starting point is you see what, what, what's in the pedigree and what stallions have worked in the pedigree already. And you see Tirana is by Cape Cross. So, so the first thing I, I thought of was you, you want to have that in the back of your mind when you're looking for your stallion. So, so the, the stallion that, that kind of jumped out at me that might suit her and that I thought was very good value is, is the like of Australia who's out of a Cape Cross mare. Now you can also go down and look at the see the stars angle um, and, and some of his sons that are at stud. But I thought Australia, given that he's already proved proven to, to get race horses, Broom, you know, he could he, he he was placed in an Epsom Derby and Australia being out of out of a Cape Cross mare, you just you just have good value, I think it's twenty seven grand or whatever, and, and, and you have that Cape Cross angle there as well. And Joseph, with your kind of thinking about these stallions and what offers value, but then at the end of the day, they end up at, you know, they're uh, on the hill with you and they are year, they're two year olds. And how does pedigree inform how you go about training them then? Like, what is your approach? It, to it? Um, the, pedigree, the pedigree doesn't, doesn't change a huge amount in the training of the horse at the early stages. They all, they all just settle into the, get broken into the gentle routine doing their work. And then you get to know the horse, and you'll know the fellas that are more mature, less mature, and and you know the seven furlong type horses, the fellas that are shaping shaping up to have a little bit of speed. So more more so when it comes to making his debut, if you weren't sure about what what distance you were going to start him off, then you might you might have a look at the pedigree and say, well, the likelihood is that this is going to be a seven furlong horser. No, there's a chance he might be quick enough for six. So so it's it's more so at the sales. And then at the later stage, when they get to actually racing, that you take the pedigree into account. Through the training, you're just doing the right thing for the horse at each stage. And Cahill, we've had Joseph kind of suggest maybe Australia as an option for Tarasilla. What kind of jump that is you at a commercial level? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think Australia is a very good option for her, actually. Yeah, because look, she's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mile and a quarter, mile and a half family. And I think there's a lot to be said for breeding like to like and obviously Australia stayed a mile and a half very well his mother stayed a mile and a half very well but they were obviously classy enough to win over shorter as well so there was no shortage of class uh, there I think see the stars you know as a cross makes an ob makes obvious appeal here as a son of Cape Cross as Joseph um, alluded to um, so I suppose I was looking at the at the sons of, of um, see the stars that I thought made a bit of sense and see the moon is a horse that's done particularly well. I think um, you know he's had some, he's had plenty of stakes, winners, plenty of winners. He may, he's got bigger and better crops probably to come over the next two or three years. He's fifteen sterling in in the UK. I think he would be, he'd be a very nice fit, and I, I think he crosses very well here with the mare. And again, you're doubling up on the Cape Cross side of it. 
um, through through see the stars along that line. So he he was the one I ended up on, but I certainly wouldn't put any Australia. I think is isn't it? the only reason Australia, I, although his value at twenty seven and a half, you're kind of spending half the budget that we have the sixty grand on him. So that kind of made me think a little bit lower in terms of spending fifteen or whatever that equates to in euro on see the moon. Okay, great. Now I think it's very exciting news. I think my father might have made it online. <laughs> Dermot, are you there? I've, I've arrived just with the help of your sister. So, uh, yes, it's good that there's somebody good technically in the family anyway. <laughs> so okay. I don't know. You, I'm probably um, going over some old ground here, am I, in terms of uh, you both made your uh, selections, have you? Well, uh, Joseph suggested Australia and uh, Cahill suggested Sea the Moon. But I suppose, Dermot, I think what's interesting to hear from you, because these are three mares. Everyone has spent so much effort mating those mares. When you go into the sales ring and you're, you know, there's thousands of mares sold every year, what makes you buy a mare? What, what is the driving force behind your thinking when you bought these three mares? Okay, so I'm Jack, I'm not here for an expert opinion at all. I'm just here for background. Is that it? Uh, Dermot, you're very much an expert opinion. Don't worry. You certainly, <laughs> at the dinner table, you definitely have an expert opinion. Anyway, anyway I suppose, yeah, you know, so um, we do our homework before the sales to some degree. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all driven by one word, and that's value. So in this particular situation, we had actually looked at it before. Sometimes you mightn't see them there before. Um, that not out of, that's not by design, but that's what happens. But if we see value, we'll be on the horse. So this, this mare, we had seen her before. She was a lovely mare. We, we all liked her because we love Shamadal, uh, being the broodmare sire. And uh, we watched her sell. And she didn't seem to be selling at 35,000. So we sent over me to Jack's mother and my wife. And of course, she's a very charming lady. And she was able to charm Pat Downs to sell us the, the mayor for 35,000. So uh, it was all driven by one word for Jack, and that's value. Because I suppose today is different than the last day. It was the purest the last day. Today is the commercial breeders. And before um, I came on, I decided I'd look for the definition in the Oxford Dictionary of what is a commercial breeder. And it's defined as one that has the primary aim of making money. And then in brackets, it said Philistine. So you have a Philistine on this side of the uh, computer today. Right, well, there you have it. So Dermot, we've had Australia, we've had Sea the Moon. What would your suggestion be for this mayor? And in fact, perhaps your suggestion is gonna be exactly what it's made it to. So what, what did you think? Uh, well, um, I looked at all the, the homework and it was very, um, I thought it was very excellent and a lot of good reasons. But a horse that I particularly like, and I think physically he'd suit her because she's a big Scorpion mare. Um, but he gets 5% stakes horses. If you get a colt, um, it's highly desirable. If, if he's got some very good fillies as well. I think he ticks the boxes in, in nearly every respect. And that is uh, Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, so Holy Roman Emperor from Dermot, we had Australia from Joseph, and we would see the moon from Cahill. A real cross-section, actually, which is really exciting. But now we have the most exciting point, and that is launching the poll to see what all of you would like to mate or to. So how does the poll come about? The poll comes about because it is the collection of the 10 most popular stallions that you all suggested. Um, and we will vote on those selections now and see what you think. So I'm just going to go down and launch our poll. There we have it. So we've launched our poll. Very exciting. You're all welcome to vote. I don't even get a nomination, do I, Jack? Uh, Dermot, you, you had, you're such as your influence, you, you, you already had a nomination. So we've had our early leader is Australia. They're listening to Joseph O'Brien, Oasis Dream, doing very well. So it's kind of like a horse race, this. <laughs> uh, it looks like it's going to be... Going to end the poll there and our results there you have it oh see the moon made a late surge so we have see the moon 
Cahill Beale, you must be very proud there. The Irish National stood 41% of the vote, uh, followed oh. by Australia and Oasis Dream. Uh, Dermot, unfortunately, Holy Roman Emperor wasn't even in the top 10 when people suggested their mating. <laughs> there you have it. No one wants to know about poor DC. Anyway, okay. our next mayor. So, Dermot, seeing as we missed you in the early on, uh, we might start with you here. And I heard you say there, sometimes you don't even look at mayors. What, what's that about? What, could you explain what, what that someone, for people so, on the line... Uh, Jack, you, you, I do look at the mayors, but sometimes if I see value in the ring that I haven't looked at, it won't stop me trying to buy one. Uh, and Desert Tiger... I can't look at all the mayors. Okay. If, I'll, I'll I, make a selection, but usually it's a selection, sometimes are not the mayors that I buy. Okay, well, Desert Tigress. You might tell us uh, a little bit about her. Well, she was in the Waterstone um, dispersal at Newmarket, and uh, we love those old families. We love being able to bring a foal, that's an Ivy League foal, to the sales. And the only way we can get an Ivy League foal is to compromise. And uh, what we compromise on is age. So um, this is an older mayor, um, but she had produced a, a Group one performer rated 117 called Growl. And also one of her daughters that was exported to um, India had uh, done very well there in terms of what she produced as well. But what was huge about the pedigree for me was uh, a mayor called Sky Beauty. Sky Beauty being one of the great mayors of, of the USA, champion older mayor in 1994. Um, and uh, been by Stormcat, who's a very, very successful, one of the great broodmare sales. So, here we had a mayor by Stormcat, one of the great broodmare sires, out of a mayor that was, you know, top, top class, um, best of a generation, um, from a magnificent family. And uh, she produced a group one placed horse. So, you know, um, definitely one that we'd always be interested in. So we actually okay. did look at this one, Jack. We had a good look at her. I remember when we did look at her on the Sunday of the uh, new market mayor sale. And... Uh, she was kind of like nearly one of the top on the list that we tried to buy, and we were successful in buying her. Um, so, now, this is why I'm, I'm delighted you've Joseph O'Brien uh, on here, because he might be able to use his influence for me here, because there's only one stallion for this mayor, but it'll take an awful lot of influence, influence I don't have. Because if you look at the most successful, one of the most successful courses, and that's Galileo and Stormcat mayors, huge, huge <laughs> success. So... Joseph, we have Churchill, Misty for me, Cl Clemmy, Coolmore, all from that cross. Could you give us a hand here, Joseph? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, cross, Dermot. And like you say, it's worked time and time again. And, and, that's, and that's what, um, what I looked at also when, when, I, when I thought about what, where you would breed the mare to. Now, obviously, I suppose, having produced Growl by Oasis Dream, you, you would nearly say that, that Oasis Dream is, is, is nearly the obvious place to start. But I, I kind of ended up on, on maybe Highland Reel um, um, because we had spent the extra few quid on Australia in the first, in the, on the first mare. I, I, th I thought if, if we had a look at Highland Reel uh, for this mare and, and purely because, like you say, the Galileo uh, has worked with Stormcat time and time again. And, and I think, I think, it's, I think it's, the, it's the logical angle um, uh, uh, to go with her. Uh, when you look at this pedigree page, I think a lot of people would look at her breeding record and they might, you know, get to a shake of, of fear because it says split early, aborted, split, died since birth, no fall. How would you approach a mare of this age, 18 years of age? How, how do, does, that, does that say alarm bells to you or how would you uh, value a mare like this and how would you go about mating it? Well, it comes back to what Dharma was saying there, like the, the fact that she has those question marks about her made her viable. If you didn't have those question marks, you probably would have made twice that, you know. Um, so it, it, it came down to value, obviously. For me, uh, the age is not so much an issue when they've produced a stakes winner, especially a very good one. You know, Growl is obviously rated very highly. He was second in a group one uh, black type winner and she could run herself. So I, I always start with can she run or not? I, I, I just keeping it very simple. She could run. She's a winner at two. She was placed fourth in a very good uh, race, the Silver Flash Stakes, which is a particular favourite of mine down through the years. Um, she's, uh, so she, she could do it and she's obviously a proven. She's, you asked me earlier about the previous mayor and I call her unproven. This mayor is proven. She's a winner and she was a good filly at two and she's plenty of pace and she's produced a horse very like her, which they tend to do. 
uh, with plenty of pace. The obvious thing here, as Joseph said, is to breathe to a waste of stream. Um, I can't see any reason why you wouldn't, to be honest with you. I say, I, unlike Joe, I saved a few quid because I really like this mare and I think a waste of stream is the obvious place to go. Um, you could also look at maybe if you wanted to do something which you might deem slightly more commercial and go to advertise who's along the same line, obviously being by showcasing um, as a first season horse. But Oasis Dream has had 17 Group 1 winners um, and he stands at the same fee. I, I, I just think there's no reason in the wide earthly world why you wouldn't just repeat that here and go with him again. Uh, Joseph, a question for you from Sarah Mulcahy. Would a fact that she's an 18-year-old mare and when she has her fall next year, she'll be 19, for some people that are selling foals out of old mares, that would be perceived as a negative for potential buyers. Is that something that you uh, bear in mind? Not for me. Uh, personally, I, I have no problem uh, um, buying an animal out of an old mare. Now, like what Carl said, what she has produced previously will, you know, if she's had 15 foals and, and one winner, then, then that's, you're going to have to look at that seriously. But if, if you have an old mare that, like this one, is, is, is proven that she can get a good horse, then I'd actually be delighted to see that she was an old mare because it would probably make it a bit less and it would put off a hell of a lot of people and, and that might, might lead to the animal being a little bit of value. But there's no doubt the market will, will penalise an, an old mare. And I suppose a, a related question, uh, Joseph, and I see it as a question a few, another few people have asked on our Q&A, and that is mayfall. So we have people thinking about covering their mares in the next couple of months is that something? You know, is that a factor for you, or is it something you also see as a bit of value? No, absolutely not. I'd have no no problem buying buying a mayfall, uh, a late mayfall even. Um, uh, obviously, you'd have to take that into account slightly when it comes to training them. Um, but but I mean, you've seen you've seen t any amount of good horses uh, born in May. Um, uh, one off the top of my head, uh, forever together. I think the filly that Dunica mm. won the won the Oaks on was like a late, a late May fall, um, um, uh, I'd have no problem, no problem buying a, a, a fall born in May, absolutely not. And Dermot, there's, I'm not just with people with, you know, that are experts listening to this, but there's also people that are getting involved and learning about May for the first time. And can you just explain why I've raised those two points? So why would people be worried about an old bear and perhaps why would someone be at a disadvantage with a May fall as opposed to a January fall? Well, uh, on the old mare thing, this is something that uh, somebody has had a bad experience with old mares. I think it always comes down to the experience that the actual person has. So if a trainer has bought uh, a number of yearlings out of older mares and they haven't worked out for them, well, then he's going to get a bias against older mares. So that's what often happens. So, you know, then if other trainers have had good success. But my philosophy is if the horse looks the part, it is the part. You know, um, and I often t uh, say to people, two horses coming up the middle of the curra in a good list of race, and one is out of an old mare and the other one's out of young mare. There's the one out of the old mare start thinking, oh my God, I'm out of an old mare, I shouldn't be winning this. You know, it's, it's like if, if it looks the path, it is the path. There's, you know, there's, there's no reason why an old, an old mare's foal can't win. So secondly, on the May fall, I think we've had a couple of, maybe a couple of years ago, there was three two-year-old... Uh, Royal Ascot winners. Yeah, yeah, Royal Ascot that won by yeah. May fall. So... Uh, it's the, it's the old thing that a month in, a, in, a, in the first year of your life is 112th, a month in two years of your life is 124th, and then as the horse starts getting older and older, the, the um, effect diminishes. So, um, you know. Because uh, all foals are born like, on the you know, I would have known, I, I, you know, uh, we, we breed, we breed in, in, in June, um, especially Every our better year. males. Maybe a commercial type one that you'd be looking at, trying to get out early. Um, you might have a second thought about that, but you know, a well-bred mare, I don't know, uh, definitely would, would, would breed them maybe in, in early June. Okay, so we've had Joseph suggest Highland Real, save a few quid. Paul, he, he raided the piggy bank on this one. He went for a waste of dream. Uh, Dermot, where was your money going? Yeah, well, um, I still make the case to anybody that listen for the full shot of Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> the basis that I don't get that. Uh, I, I'm I'm going on Oasis Dream as well. He's eight percent stakes winners. Uh, yearly average is ninety thousand, which is good for the com for, you know as a commercial decision. Uh, you know he's an outstanding sire year year uh, year out. He had a, a bit of a dip there a couple of years ago, but I think that's reflected in his price now. He's a good sire, and that's where I go. Okay, great. Well, we're going to launch our poll again, so buckle up. 
here we go to poll number two. So this is again the collection of 10, the 10 most popular matings for desert tigress. That's our next mare, one second. Just Jack, while you're while you're yeah. collating those scores there, just a, a, a further thought on the older mare thing. The uh, I often think like if, if you if you if there were ten thousand mares and you followed them through, and they might be say there'd be one percent stakes winners out of it, there'd be a hundred stakes winners in the first crop, and so on, so on, so on. When the mare produces a stakes winner, especially one that's recent, that changes the probability of her throwing a second one completely for me. So. There is definitely a bias, and there, there's, there's no doubt that if you took 10,000 mares and you didn't know anything about them, that you would say they were far more likely to produce a stakes winner in their first five or six foals than in their second five or six foals. But if you've got one that's produced a stakes winner, she's every bit as likely to produce, she's more likely to produce a stakes winner subsequently than a random mare having her first few foals. So I think it's all about context. Yeah, I think what happens as well with the older mares is that uh, you have this thing about freshening up an older mare, so people say, oh, I'll breed it to a first season sire, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And of course, most first season sires are going to fail. So there's an inbuilt bias against the mare there in a, in a lot of years as well. So there's a lot of variables, I think, but there's a lot of variables maybe against the older mare. Um, but if, I think if you continue to breed her well, um, you can continue to get good horses. Okay, so we have a, a careering away leader here again, um, and it is. Oasis Dream. So there you have it, Oasis Dream wins that one. Um, Cahill, Dermot, they've listened. So our next mayor, Isanus. So uh, this is a, fr a bit of French flair to our evening. And we're going to learn about Isanus here. Here's their catalogue page. Dermot, you might tell us what attracted you to Isanus at 35,000 at Arcana. Yeah, so um, when it comes to a, a, a catalogue, we kind of look at it differently sometimes. And, you know, at this particular catalogue, what stuck out for me more than anything else was the amount of mares in it that were in Fort de Have. There was 18 mares in Fort de Have. So this suggested to me straight up, there's going to be a couple of mares here worth, worth value in that particular uh, Arcana last year, 2019, breeding stock sale. Because, you know, there's a certain demand for mares in Fort de Have. But here we had 18, which, you know, there was a significant uh, uh, person with uh, sh shares in um, the particular horse, Le Havre, and he was offloading a lot of the mares it looked like to us. So we identified Le Havre as, as a, a world-class stallion, really, and a stallion that we would be well worth trying to get a mare and foal to, at the sale. So we ended up buying two. Um, we um, bought, this is the second one we bought. I think I, Jack was very keen on this one. I think I actually got a better one, but uh, that's another story. But uh, we, we ended up buying this on the way to the uh, boat. Um, this is the second day of the sale on the Sunday. And... Uh, as he stands for 50,000, to, to get this particular one for 35,000, we were over the moon. Um, so, um, you know, looking at the page, she's a stakes winner herself, rated 97. And then she produces a horse much better than herself while I have, rated 111. Uh, group one placed, listed winner, and she produces another horse by I have, rated 84. And then you have this little blip in the pedigree, it says unraced, unraced, unraced for three three horses and race twice. So there's one horse not much good and three unlucky horses. That's the way I'm looking at it anyway. They were, they, they, you know, they didn't get to the racetrack. So what she got to the racetrack was three horses and she had two winners and one was a group one placed horse. So um, I think she was really good value. We were delighted to get her and we got a very good cold fall out of her. So uh, uh, was, which was one of, we weigh all the folds and, and in terms of weight, it was one of the biggest folds we had this year. So, uh, um, very, very pleased with the purchase. Um, will I go on to talk about what I'm thinking, of, what we're thinking about breeding at the Jack? Not just yet, but we will come back to that. Uh, Joseph, yeah. a question that uh, has been asked for you, of course, your, your mother and your whole, your mother's a wonderful owner breeder. 
um, and your whole family are fantastic breeders. But you, you, of course, have to acquire these mares as well. You go sometimes go to the sales. If you're thinking about buying a mare, a question uh, uh, from uh, one of our uh, participants online has been, how do you approach buying a mare? What do you do when you, in contrast to Dermot, how do you approach a catalogue of a mare sale? I, I suppose the, the, the most important thing with the, with the mare sale and probably the, that what we would have in mind is, is not to discount too many mares before they go through the ring. And just because you think a mare might be out of your budget, make sure and, make sure and sit there and watch her going through because you don't know what the market is going to, or what, where the market is going to put each mare. And because there might be something small that you're willing to forgive that a lot of people won't, it could have the price that you expect the mare to make. So I think like what, like what kind of Dermot alerted, alluded to earlier, I think it's very important to have, have your list of pedigrees that you like and see as many of them as possible, but to see as many mares possible through the ring as you can or, or, or or, or be there to see them through the ring because ultimately just because you think something is going to make too much and if you think it will it probably will but but they don't always so I think to make sure that your list is long and, and make sure that you have a rough evaluation of the mare and then when you see them going through the ring you can make up your mind I, I thought that mare would be making a lot more and you can you can you can t- chance of having a bid on her if, she, if you think she's good value but I think it's very important not to Oh, have your short list too short uh, because you, you, it's ultimately value with what you're looking for and you have to be there to see them going through to, 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 to find the value. And Cahill, I suppose you have Joseph and you have Dermot, you know, two experts in their field. But, you know, for people watching this uh, right now, you know, they are people that are stri- striving to put a few, together a few quid to buy their mare and they're only going to have two or three mares and it's a very nervous mo- moment for them to put up their hand and just say, I'm going to buy this mare. I'm going to, this is going to be one of the ones. So to have a long list can be perhaps more intimidating than having a short list because they can say, well, actually, I'm quite particular. Well, you know, when, when you're talking to the students in the Irish National Stud and they're, you know, they're moving out in the world and they're trying to explore how they will invest and make their first investments, what kind of are the key things you're saying to them to focus on and perhaps forgive or that's overestimated by the market? Or what, what would you say to the people online watching now so that they can have a bit of value? Uh, well, the first thing I'd say to them is join the Irish National Stud Mayor Syndicate. Uh, shameless plug. <laughs> it's, it's, it's closed, actually, so you can't. So it's not a shameless plug. My word. No, my word. There's uh, no room at the end. <laughs> uh, what would I say? I, I, think, I think keep it very simple, and I think keep a long list. I think Joseph is exactly right. Uh, I, I, I kind of work the catalogue a bit like a game of guess who. You sort of start off with everything there and you just start flicking a few of the lads down that you don't like the look of. And uh, then you physically go and see the mares. And I'm very easy on the mare, you know, as long as she can walk, uh, as long as she's enough size about her, as long as she's not too incorrect. I'd be, you know, I, w- I wouldn't be very quick to knock a mare physically, uh, but I definitely want to see them all so that I have an idea as to what mating plan I'd have in my head for them. But um, uh, I, I, to me it always starts with the race record and black type in the first dam they're the two critical things and that's the easiest way to begin the process and just to say I want something that can run and I want something that uh, you know if, if the mare hasn't obviously if she's a young mare and hasn't had any foals what her mother has done and if there's no black type winners in that first dam I'm not really interested so th- those, those are the two very simple things I would do and kind of yeah you just you work it like a game of guess who you try and keep as many horses on as you can I suppose very the easiest thing in the world is to knock horses off a list. It's much harder to keep them on. You value them then, and then you sit there and you watch them all go through. And usually, in our case, you know, probably fifty or sixty mares would go through without us, you know, even getting our hand up. And it's the sixty-first one that you end up buying. So it's it's you've got to be very, you've got to have done the homework, and you've got to be very disciplined when you get into the ring. When you do see that little bit of value having the, the cojones to stick your hand up. Because you, you always remember that you are the person who values that horse the very most in the world when you buy it. So that's always a fairly frightening thought. Okay, well, the man who wasn't frightened and managed to buy the horse is here with us. We've, Dermot, we've had some great suggestions. We've had Jerry Horne said, make believe, Marion Passer said, Phoenix of Spain and said, let's uh, knock on Cahill's door. Um, you know, and we've a whole host of options for this bear. She, but Zamindar... Uh, Dermot, was there, was there anything with the midnight that attracted you to this one? 
Yeah, well, Chakrosi is a wonderful broodmare sire, isn't he? Isn't he the sire of broodmare sire of New Bay King Man? You know, outstanding broodmare sire of Group One horses. Um, so, um, Zamender, you know, you'd have to rate him as in you know, a top top class broodmare sire. Um, I wasn't uh, around at the, at the introductions, Jack, but I was going to say that uh, sometimes uh, this whole thing is is a kind of big jigsaw for me because. Uh, I have a, a lot of uh, breeding lights and stallion shares that have accumulated over the years. And I have a big matching process to do here. So, you know, and uh, um, horse that I bought a share in this year that hasn't come on the list too much there and in, in looking down to the list that people suggested. But I think, you know, enhancing the, the uh, French connection and what I also like to do in a pedigree, I don't like to compromise a pedigree by, if I see a, a middle distance stand type horse, I like to go for that type of stallion. Um, so, and that, you know, this is a middle distance uh, type pedigree. So, um, a stallion that I'm going to give serious consideration for here is uh, 2019 Aquin, the Waldegeist, who's, you know, a standing in the Valley Lynn Stud, son of Galileo, uh, group one winner at two, they only won five million in prize money. And, uh, um, you know, I, you know, I'm going to have to use the horse, and I think this would be a very, very good mating uh, as a shareholder in Waldegeist. Okay, great, Joseph. What did you think? Um, I, I thought um, um, uh, a similar to Derma, a, a kind of a, a freshen up and a change to kind of anything that she's she's bred to so far. Now, I, I thought maybe uh, to look for a proven stallion. Um, uh, and a bit of value, and I actually thought Holy Roman Emperor might might suit her. Um, uh, obviously, a very good stallion. He, he gets you a good colt or a filly, like like Dermot said earlier on. Uh, the colts are, are very very saleable, and uh, Zamin there is a great broodmare sire. Um, um, uh, so I, I thought Holy Roman at fifteen grand was good value. I used up a little, used up a few quid earlier on in play, so I had to I had to I had to come down uh, on our. On our and what what we're going to spend on this mare, and I thought Holy Roman was a good was a good option for her. Well, Ronan Woods is delighted with your selection, Dermot. He says, "Good mind, think alike." Uh, Cahill, what what did, where did you go here? Well, I, I blew the budget on the last two, so I'm down to the last few few bob. Uh, did this is the this is the mare I think that is the most obvious uh, to make an instant profit. You know, they've, you've got a La Harve Colt straight away. Like, she was bought for 35 grand. The covering fee for the horse is 40 or 50 or, you know, far exceeds what you even paid for the mare. So I think there's an instant chance of getting an instant return here on this mare. So I sort of took it, let's keep the expenditure low from here on out and, and maybe spend a little less on her than I spent on the other two. So I'm looking at something around the 10 grand mark. The interesting thing about the pedigree, like, she's a very deep family and everything else. Uh... I think what would really work here is is something along the Danzig line that's worked very well with Zamandar. Uh, two two things have worked that very well with that, Zamandar. I think the the inbreeding to Mister Prospector. So Dermot mentioned New Bay earlier on, uh, who's obviously by Dubawi, um, which is Mister Prospector line, and so is Zarak, uh, also by Dubawi, both out of Zamandar mares, and obviously one of the best horses the last ten years, Kingman. Uh, is out of a Zamandar mare, so he's he's on he's the other thing I'm looking at in terms of uh, Green Desert or Danzig Line stallion. Obviously, uh, Sons of Invincible Spirit will be higher in the list here, um, or or certainly Sons of Danzig. So I had I, there was sort of I thought a first season sire actually might be the way to go here because I again my first question is always is she proven is she not proven she's proven she's a good race mare and she produced an even better uh, filly than herself. I think that's always a very strong sign. So I, I would put her down very much as a proven mare. So I'd be going for a first season sire just on the pure commerciality of it, uh, like, like Dermot did. But I'm going with a little bit more pace and a little bit more speed. Because, you know, she's a sprinter miler to me. Maybe like the Jean Pratt is a mile. Um, the La Hoguette, anyway, like the best horse in the, in the first stand there. So I've gone for three options. Soldier's Call, who's by showcasing bread on the Danzig line, a nice horse down in Joe Foley's. Invincible Army. Who's uh, who, who's obviously a son of invincible spirit, but I actually took a little bit of a left field move and saved you another few quid here. Thank you, Carl. By yeah. looking looking at a horse I quite like, Inns of Court, who's a Group Two winner. Uh, he's by Invincible Spirit, obviously, and he's also on his dam side got uh, inbreeding to Northern to um, Mister Prospector. 
So the two things that have worked with Zamandar, the Green Desert line and the, the inbreeding to Northern Prospector, Mr. Prospector, you're getting both of that by using uh, Inns of Court. And he's only seven and a half grand. I think he should be one of the very strongest mares in his book, which is something we might touch on a little bit later. It's the importance of kind of having an understanding of a, of a stallion's book and trying to be in the top 20% of a stallion's book is always a an interesting commercial play and something we'd always look at, not to over uh, mate your mares to try and be one of the better ones in the crop. Um, so I've gone with him at seven and a half grand. Uh, he's, he's good value and that gets me to pretty bang on 60 grand of a spend, I think, for the tree. Great. Well, let's mate our final mare. Here we go. And we're launching the poll. Pahal, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that Inns of Court did not make the list. Holy Roman, Holy Roman Emperor is doing very well for Joseph. Baltagite for Dermot. Here we go. And our winner. My God, they listened to my father. Something I've never been known to do. Uh, <laughs> 25 votes for Baltagite and 26%. He's the one that takes it. That's great. Now, we might... Just Jack, just, the, just before you move on from the from the yes. polls, the uh, I, I just looking through the homework, like the level the level of interaction with this whole thing has been fantastic. And just some great. I, I did the matings first myself, and then went back and had a look at some of the homework. I thought it was some great ideas. There was one in there that I thought was just just purely on pedigree analysis. I thought was an interesting one. Fascinating rock, who's down in the third dam. So somebody I can't remember who it was, but somebody had suggested inbreeding to Corida. Uh, down in the third Amethyst. I Just worth mentioning, it was very well researched and an interesting shout to go with Fascinating Rock uh, for that. But, um, I think it's yeah. called the Rasmussen Breeden, is it, Carl? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to ring Fiona and Alan for that sort of discussion. <laughs> yes, I believe uh, so. Yeah, breeding to superior females. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for for the for the uh, the real pedigree gurus out there, I thought that was just worth mentioning. It was it was a, it was a well thought out idea, at least. Okay. I'm glad you brought up the tone towards the end of the conversation, in your Cahill. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now asking questions. I, I, I'd encourage you to chat away. Let uh, let us know what you would like to ask our three uh, experts. Uh, Joseph, I want to start with a question for you from Tom O'Malley, and that is. From your training career and transitioning from training to riding and you know your first suggestion was australia a horse you rode yourself has that has, has that informed the way you train progeny of those stallions um um i suppose um it's a good question i, I don't think it changes the way the way that you train them really but it certainly is a an advantage to know uh, the traits to expect and, and know the different things maybe that that might might work for them um but uh, to to be to, i don't think it would change the way you train them but i think it's certainly a, a big help to know um uh, as much about a horse as you can and and to know the dam or the sire is certainly it certainly can only be an advantage uh, we're having we're having accusations that dermot might be owed over budget from peter appleton there's going to be need to be doing some, some maths in respect of that but Carl, I suppose, coming back to what you were saying, and, uh, and a question that uh, another uh, panelist, or, or, sorry, another participant has asked, is uh, a fold share. Could you explain what a fold share is and why a commercial breeder might look to do a fold share on a particular stallion? Um, yeah, well, if you've, if you've got a very nice mare and, <laughs> you know, so, sometimes it comes up where you've got a nice mare and she produces a very good horse and you want to repeat that or you want to do something... Uh, along those same lines, for example, and you approach the stallion farm to assess the mare's pedigree and to assess whether they might go into partnership on that fold. So instead of paying your nomination fee up front, uh, we we sort of kick it into the in, in, in to the end of the sales and we divide the proceeds 50-50. So we share that fold with you instead of charging you for the nomination fee. So it's um it's something we do you know, relatively sparingly, um, but it, it does work quite well in certain cases where maybe, maybe a breeder has sort of happened on a very good mare and wants to breed it to, to one of the top end stallions. And um, it, it, it makes sense for both parties to partner up on that particular foal and, and sell it in partnership. 
Okay, so Derbert, uh, a question for you from uh, Kerry Freeman, and that is, is there a particular algorithm when you are thinking about valuing a mare, that, how you approach it? So if a mare is worth 40K, would you look at the stallion fee at what level at that, va- you know, that valuation? Or how, would, how do you kind of approach that in your head? I suppose, Jack, an al- algorithm is a mixture of a whole pile of variables brought into a formula. And uh, I suppose th- that kind of, uh, all those variables are going through your head as you sit in the seats um, at the December sales and you watch this mail going in. So, uh, um, I, I, yes, um, it's, algorithm is probably a, a fancy wor- word for experience, knowing what, what, you know, what a horse potentially is worth out of that particular mayor. Often when I'm buying a, a mayor, um, you know, I'm thinking already, who's going to buy it as a fold? Who's going to buy it as a yearling? Um, so, um, as I say, as a, you know, I would be very much aware of you know, yearling averages, uh, fall averages, uh, who's, who might be able to, uh, you know, would buy that particular uh, fall a yearling off me. Uh, what of my stallion nominations I might be able to use in the mayor next year. So um, it's a kind of an informal al- algorithm, if you like, Jack, that's gone through my head as I'm uh, about to purchase one. Okay, great. And, and Joseph, a question to you, because, you know, we're all optimistically looking forward to hopefully having racing back very soon. And please God, it does. And is there any two-year-old stallion, you know, first crop stallions is always it's such a fun time of the year when the two-year-olds are coming out of their bike stallions that are having their first crop, which is their first runners on the track. Is there anything on the hill at the moment that's impressing you? Yeah, I suppose there there is a couple of uh, first season sires catching our eye at this stage. Obviously, the 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 real telling um, uh, telling of them is when they get to the track. But I I, I have a, a nice call by Shala. Um, is going is going nicely. I have a, I have a couple of animals by the Gurkha that 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 look to be um, nice and and quite mature. Uh, also, I have a call by Memas that that's going quite well. And and um, um and there's seems to be a good bit of chat around Air Force Blue, so they're the couple that I have first hand experience of and, and have them in the yard at at this stage would would seem seem quite nice. Okay, brilliant. And Cahill, you just touched upon it and you said you'd like to discuss it a little bit further. Um, book size. How does that impact how you breed your mares? And what is book size to get right into the nitty gritty? Uh, book size is just how many mares a stallion will cover in a given year. Um, sure, it has a big impact. It's it's supply and demand. It's sort of simple economics, really. You, you don't you probably don't want to breed to a stallion that's covering a huge amount of mares and being one of two hundred and twenty on the ground. Um, but also uh, the the bigger point when you're trying to mate them is you you can't have that information. You don't know how popular a stallion is when you're making your decision. What you do know roughly speaking is how to value your mare so we the, the valuations of the mares there is easy because that's what you paid for them back in december so that wasn't the challenge as part of this process but if you have, if you have a mare that you've had for four or five years a good process is to sit down and actually value them at you know at the end of the year every year and that, that'll actually dictate how much you want to spend on the nomination and the old you know adage was always you want to spend somewhere in the region of a third of the value of the mayor on the future nomination, which is what I think we've all tried to do here as well. Um, so, but in so doing, you give yourself a chance then by not over covering your mayor of being in the top 25, 30% of a stallion's book. Because one of the big things is, is, is that whole notion that everybody is under pressure to try and use the sexy stallion or to, you know, to, we're all focused on that, that sort of top 20% of stallions and those stallions are way oversubscribed all the time. But actually, there's a lot of very good stallions in the medium range or in the, the lower range that if you sent your mare to will be a more profitable decision for you because you, the mare will do a little bit of the work for you and you'll be the best by that sire. Okay, great. Uh, Derbert, it was a question we touched upon at the start, but I think it'd be good to get your thoughts now. And a few people have asked for it in our Q&A function. And that is your advice. You know, you started when you were starting out buying a mare for the first time you talked about value. Is there anything in particular you think when you go to the sales, they're underrated in terms of people's approach to buying them? Is there a type of mare that you would encourage people to take a second look at? Or what would you, what would your advice be people that are watching online at the moment? Uh, well, I think what you have to do is uh, take, sometimes take the long view. Um, and you always have to compromise on something. You know, um, I remember one time I bought a mare with a very bad string halt. And, uh, 
lo and behold, when she, when she was pregnant the following year, she'd no string halt, um, but it really decreased her value. Um, but uh, I, I was very lucky two years ago that uh, Maxius was going to be cold um, as a flat stallion. And uh, I bought a, a green, a Merkel green swallow in full to Maxius, a group three winner, who was a dam of a group two winner. But because he was in full to Maxius, people concentrated on the Maxius. But, you know, um, she'd had a very, very good horse, uh, two, and a number of very good horses previous to that. So I, I decided I'd compromise on the cover. And, uh, but I would breed her really well the next year. So I put her in full to Oasis Dream. We got a smashing Oasis Dream there about two weeks ago. So job done. So, you know, you just, you, you can't take all the boxes. You have to compromise and sometimes you have to play the long game. Okay, that's, so that, that was a £25,000 uh, sterling nomination and it was only a £10,000 there. So there you go. It's not always the same. It's not always just about an algorithm and it's a third of the value, a half of the value. But I suppose, Joseph, a lot of people are very excited that you're on the call because when they breed these horses, uh, and they go to sell them in the next few years after listening to your advice tonight, you're obviously going to buy every single horse that was bred on the results of tonight's uh, <laughs> webinar. Uh, but I suppose... I look uh, at them anyway, Jack. Yeah, yeah, look at them anyway. Yeah, look at them. Yeah, that, that's free. That's free of charge. Uh, but I suppose, Joseph, I suppose a quick one, and if I kind of will wrap up with a question to each of you. And, uh, and commercial breeding and, and going out and, and breeding the stallions and thinking you can do it. It is attainable for people. They can go out and they can produce a good racehorse. It's not just about the rarefied Galileos. And I know that would be something that you've been exposed to all your life, but now being a trainer and seeing commercial breeders and how hard they work, it is a dream that's possible for people. Very much so. And, and I, I personally would even go to the sales and, and I would purposely be looking for animals at that area of the market. Because there's so many races, uh, you, like this median auction series, um, you can see all the work that Joe Foley has done with this Ballyhane race. And, and there's so much prize money on offer in all those races that you have to have horses to compete in them. So it's an area of the market that, that we as trainers have to concentrate on and have to have horses for. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Joseph. And uh, Cahill, a, a question that's come in for you in your... Uh, approach to teaching the Irish National Stud students and there's so many participants that we have online at the moment what resources would you say to them to go out re and research and read people love book recommendations in particular uh, YouTube clips or anything like that is there anything you particularly go back to again and again as a good read? I love um, Miles Napier's book Thoroughbred Pedigree Simplified that's that's about the best that I've ever come across that covers an awful lot I think the man passed away last year but it was a lovely book written maybe 10 or 15 years ago which uh, traces through the very simple pedigrees I, I actually pulled one off the shelf the other day this was a good stimulus for me to dust the cobwebs off the old pedigree books uh, and I found this one which I found really good uh, Racehorse Breeding Theories by Frank Mitchell. So all, I, have all, I have a copy myself, Cahill. Uh, you're not alone in having that book. Yeah, very that's, good. Uh, that's a great one. Yeah, there's, and if, I suppose it's probably a little bit more advanced than the Miles Napier one, but they're the two. Uh, they're, they're the two that um, if you want to delve into, you know, the, the theories behind it, like, and what, what uh, the, the, the basic to, not spoiler alerts, the basic assumption of, of all the theories combined in, in racehorse breeding theories anyway, is that it comes down to the race record of the mare and the first dam and that the first two generations are crucial. But there's an awful amount of research that goes into the science behind all those other elements. As Dermot said, the Rasmussen factor or the dosage profiles or all these other wild and, and fanciful sort of things. But ultimately, it's, it's what's in front of you on the page. that uh, the, 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 the theory, it, it always comes back to that. It always comes back to that. And just one final point, you've called this thing the art of the mating as opposed to the science of the mating. I think that's pretty interesting and critical because it, it is an art. Uh, science by its very nature, you've got to be able to prove it into the future. And because there are so many variables and factors at play, nobody has ever come up with a theory that can be proved subsequently into the future for time and time again, that holds all the time. So we're dealing in probabilities as opposed to scientific facts. And that's what makes it so interesting. And that's why it is an art as opposed to a science. Thanks very much, Cahill. And Dermot, you'd be giving it out to me if I didn't, so we'll, we'll do so. The final word to you, and that yeah. is, you know, a lot of people have a lot of, you know, same related question, I suppose, to Cahill, and that is a lot of people have a bit more downtime. You know, they're looking 
to research this area. They're, they're actively participating at the moment. What advice would you give to them to, to learn and to develop so they can feel confident when it comes to the autumn that they might go to the sales and purchase their first broodmare? Um, well, I think there's two aspects to it, Jack. You know, we're kind of emphasizing the genetics here and the, and the race farm and that, but that's only one aspect of it. The other aspect is raising your horse. And I think Joseph touched on that there, you know, so um, we need to be producing sound horses because we're, they're not all going to be group winners. They're not all going to be um, listed winners. But we need sound horses because there's an awful lot of races out there to be won at all levels. So whatever you do, pick a mayor and pick a stallion that has a record of getting sound horses and take advice on how to raise that horse properly in terms of um, feeding, uh, you know, in terms of where it is raised, um, because you know, we, we, our reputation is based on the Irish horse and the Irish sound horse, and we all have to kind of emphasize that when we're selling our horses, that uh, this horse is a horse that's going to be durable and he's going to win races. He might win races at the top level, but uh, he's going to be there um, for, for the day out for whoever buys them. And that's why you, you get people coming back time and time again. So concentrate to some extent on the mayor, but at the same time, um, you have to put an awful lot of emphasis on how these horses are raised. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you, Dermot. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Cahill. That is it for this evening. Um, this is all about just getting people interact about meetings, learning uh, as much as we can, if you have any feedback at all, please send it to my uh, Twitter account, which is at Jack Cantillon. We'd love to hear from you. I want to hear more questions. I want to hear what, what you want to hear from. And we will do exactly that, because it's just about finding, providing people a wealth of distraction and a bit of fun in a, what could be a difficult time for everyone. So please stay safe. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.